wash away in my sin Nothing but the blood of Jesus What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, precious is the flow That makes me white as snow No other fount I know Nothing but the blood of Jesus Nothing can for sin atone Nothing but the blood of Good evening, everybody. Tonight is Maundy Thursday. Maundy is an old English word that means holy. This is Holy Thursday. It's the day we commemorate the Last Supper when Jesus sat at the table with his apostles and he administered the elements for the very first time and transformed a Passover celebration that celebrated God's deliverance in the past and turned it into a celebration of what God is going to do in the present through him on the cross. Very special event. And so tonight we celebrate and we commemorate Christ's work on the cross or the, at the Last Supper. Tomorrow we'll be getting into Isaiah 53 and getting into a theology of the substitutionary atonement of Jesus. But as we begin our worship service, make sure you check the bulletin for anything that may affect you the most specifically. Of course, we have Good Friday worship service tomorrow, one o'clock here at the church. We also have men's Bible study Saturday morning at 7 a.m. at Seven Angels. But we're, we're, we're inviting the men's wives along too. They're gonna join us for Bible study tomorrow. We're excited about that. And we're Saturday morning at 7 a.m. And we're gonna be studying the book of 1 John, 1 John chapter one. It's only 10 verses in that chapter. So we're gonna be eating our pancakes and our biscuits and gravy and getting into the word of God. So we're gonna get fed twice, Saturday morning. And then of course, Easter Sunday, 9 a.m. Hey, do we have any other announcements to highlight as we begin our Maundy Thursday worship service? If not, then this concludes our evening announcements. Let us bow our heads for prayer as we enter into this time of worship. Lord, we love you so much. It is an honor. It is a privilege. It is a pleasure. It is a blessing to be able to learn more about you, and especially this time of year as we commemorate and celebrate the work you did for us on Maundy Thursday, Good Friday, and Easter Sunday. As we enter into this time of, of somber celebration, but also joyful celebration for all that was accomplished, we hand the whole time over to you. In Jesus' name. Power in the blood of Amen. Jesus. Well, let's stand together and...
Amen. Good singing. We'll remain standing for the reciting of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the one holy universal Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank Christmas you. You may be seated. Children's sermon. We sing, usually we sing three songs in a worship service. If it's a short song, maybe four, but usually it's three. And the reason why we sing songs in church because the Bible says that we should do that. Ephesians 5.19 says that we should sing and make music in our hearts to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we sing a lot of what we call gospel songs. A lot of the songs in our hymnal were sung during Billy Graham crusades and D.L. Moody crusades. They're at the heart of American evangelical faith. But we also have some hymns that go even further back than that, all the way to the Protestant Reformation when Martin Luther, he was the one who wrote, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. So we have a heritage of faith. And we love the new songs too. We love the, the praise and worship, the contemporary ones as well. God has blessed us with so many great songs to sing. I was just talking to one of the kids the other day that said, Pastor Mark, we need to sing God's Not Dead Again. You know, we haven't rocked out to that one by the newsboys in a while. So we'll probably be singing that again real soon too. So sing to the Lord, sing our praises to him, give him all the glory. Jesus loves you, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And now we're going to have our Bible lessons. chapters of 1 Corinthians, Paul is writing to them about concerns that he has. And then beginning in chapter 7, he answers concerns that they have. But now here in chapter 11, he's going back to bringing up one of his, con his own concerns. And it's a really big concern. They're not taking the Lord's Supper. They're not having communion in an in a worthy manner. They're taking it in a disrespectful way. And he addresses that in 1 Corinthians 11, beginning in verse 17. In the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. No doubt there have to be differences among you to show which of you have God's approval. When you come together, it's not the Lord's Supper you eat, for as you eat, each of you goes ahead without waiting for anybody else. One remains hungry, another gets drunk. Don't you have homes to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I praise you? Certainly not in this manner. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. A man ought to examine himself before he partakes of the bread and the cup. For whoever takes of the bread and drinks of the cup in, without recognizing the body of the Lord eats and drinks judgment unto himself. That is why some of you are weak and sick and a number of you have fallen asleep. But if we had judged ourselves, we would not come under judgment. 
When we are judged by the Lord, we are disciplined so that we won't be condemned with the world. So then, my brothers, when you come together to eat, wait for each other. If anyone is hungry, he should eat at home so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. And when I come, I will give further direction upon the word of God. This is Let us pray. the God, I thank you so much for these scriptures, and I pray now that the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart would be faithful to the scriptures. In Jesus' name, amen. Monday is usually my day off, so on a recent Monday, Jeannie and I decided that we were going to go to Manitowoc, and so we hopped in the car and went on our way. About 10 minutes into the drive, Jeannie looked over at me behind the wheel and said, Mark, Mark, how come we're headed toward Appleton? <laughs> I said, oh no, muscle memory. I go to Appleton way more often than I go to Manitowoc, so my brain and my body naturally headed toward there. And I've heard that they have these things that are called senior moments. I don't know if you've ever heard of them. I hear that they happen more and more as you get older. I'm just glad that Jeannie was there to let me know I was going the wrong direction and that I had to turn in the right direction. Paul is writing the Corinthians to let them know they're going in the wrong direction spiritually. And this was breaking his heart because Paul and a married couple named Priscilla and Aquila. They started this church, according to Acts chapter 18, and they poured their heart and their soul into building up the Christian congregation in Corinth. Now they've moved on to Ephesus, 250 miles away, to start a congregation there, but while they're there, they found out that the Corinthian congregation has gone off the rails. They're arguing about which apostle is the greatest. They're not getting along. They are tolerating sexual sin in the congregation. And they're getting so mad at each other that they're suing each other and taking each other to court in front of unbelievers rather than handling that stuff in-house amongst the people of God. And then in 1 Corinthians 11, we find out that they are desecrating the Holy Communion table and taking communion in an unworthy manner. And so Paul is urging them and calling on them to correct these situations and come back to God. You know, communion is the holiest ceremony that we have in the church. Approaching the communion table is almost like approaching the Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament. And if you did that in an unworthy manner, you were liable to the judgment of God. And the judgment of God was beginning to fall on the Corinthian church. And some people were actually dying under the judgment of God because of the disrespect they were showing the communion service. And I feel really compelled by the Spirit every couple of years, to talk about the significance of taking Holy Communion. Because it is the most sacred ceremony that we have in the life of the church. And one of the best times to talk about it is when we remember when the Lord Jesus Christ instituted it at the Last Supper. So that's what we're going to do. We're going to talk about taking communion seriously. Paul wrote the book of 1 Corinthians about 25 years after the death and resurrection of Jesus. So we'll say 55 AD. And it's all about doing everything in love. I read a, a theological PhD on 1 Corinthians. It was written by a Dallas Seminary student. And he had a brilliant outline of 1 Corinthians. And so I adopted it. I, th I think he was right on the money. He says in the first four chapters... It's about how doing everything in love means maintaining relational unity. Chapter 6, doing everything in love means maintaining spiritual integrity. Chapter 7, it means strengthening marital unity. Chapters 8, 9, and 10, it means maintaining, realizing that there's a limitation on liberty. Here in chapter 11, 
It means taking communion seriously. We pick up the action in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 17. And Paul first underscores the wrong way to take communion. He says in the following directives, I have no praise for you, for your meetings do more harm than good. Ouch. Can you imagine somebody coming to our church and then you asking him afterwards, what did you think of the service at Peace Evangelical and Reformed Church? And to hear them say, you know what? I don't have any praise for you because your meetings do more harm than good. I mean, ow. And what's more devastating is that the guy who started the church is the one who's saying it. He's like, man, you are messing up and you're not taking this seriously. In the first place, I hear that when you come together as a church, there are divisions among you, and to some extent, I believe it. You know, communion is supposed to be a time when the family of God comes together at the foot of the cross. But instead of this being a time of integration, it has become a time of segregation between the rich people and the poor people. Because the rich people who could afford to get off of work early were coming to the worship service. They were eating up the communion. They were drinking the wine to excess to the point where they were getting drunk. They were treating it like a pagan love feast rather than than the holy communion service for the Lord Jesus Christ. And then the people who were the common person just getting off of work would show up and all the food would be gone except a few scraps of bread lying around. Warren Wearsby says in his commentary about this that for some of the poor people that this was the most substantial meal that they were able to eat all week long. So when they showed up and all the food was gone and all the wine was drunk, their stomachs hurt, but their hearts hurt too because they were being so disregarded by the wealthier believers in the church. And that's why, you know, in our church, when we take communion, we always make sure that everybody has a chance to take the bread, and then we partake together. We've had to ad lib a little bit during the pandemic, during COVID-19, but we always say, let us partake together. And in a normal communion service, that's what we do. Because true communion doesn't just happen when you take communion by yourself. It's when the congregation communes with Christ as a community. And it was breaking Paul's heart that there wasn't a sense of community in that particular parish. Now, we are blessed here at Peace Church. We have a wonderful sense of community. But it wasn't going on in this particular church. So treating the communion table with respect means treating the people around you at the communion table with respect. You can't humiliate and hurt others and then come to the table of the Lord like there's nothing wrong. Romans 15 verse 7 says, Accept one another, therefore, as Christ accepted you in order to bring praise to God. And Matthew 7 verse 12 says, Do to others what you would have them do to you. And that means not scarfing down all the food and leaving out other people just because they have to work for a living and can't make it to the worship service when you can. So taking communion while harboring a heartless attitude toward others is the wrong way to take communion. That's what Paul's saying in verses 17 to 22. Now, let's transition to verse 23 where Paul talks about the right way to take communion. Listen to what he says. For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of, of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. You've heard me say these words, I'm going to guess, hundreds of times over the years. And because you've heard them so many times, Maybe we need to hear them again because they were radical. The first time Jesus said this, this was a mind-blowing thing that he made this comment. Because when he said it, they, weren't, they didn't have Holy Communion yet. 
They were celebrating a Jewish holiday called Passover. The Passover commemorates how God brought the Israelites out of Egypt. The unleavened bread symbolized the bread the Israelites had to eat in a hurry before the Egyptians kicked them out of the country. And the cup of wine symbolizes the blood that was posted on the doorposts of their houses that covered over their sin so that they didn't experience the judgment of God along with the Egyptian firstborn. But Jesus is reinterpreting this holiday. He's saying it's no longer just about the deliverance that God did in the past. It's about the deliverance that God is about to do right now on the cross with my body and blood. And I, that is just an incredibly unprecedented statement. I mean, think about it this way. Let's say it's Valentine's Day coming up. And I, at Valentine's Day, I say to you, you know what? We're going to celebrate Valentine's Day a lot differently now. It's no longer about you expressing your love for your significant other. From now on, Valentine's Day is about how much you love your pastor. In particular, Pastor Mark. You love him so much, so from now on, St. Valentine's Day is going to be called St. Mark's Day. <laughs> what would you think of that? You would say, Mark, we do love you, but you need help. And so we would like to see you get some therapy. We recommend St. Elizabeth's Hospital, the seventh floor, the psych ward. They'll watch over you for 72 hours and make sure everything's okay. They'll give you a warm blanket. They'll give you milk. They'll give you cookies, and, and everything will be all right. <laughs> I mean, it's unprecedented, but the Lord Jesus Christ, because he is Lord, he transcends every holiday on the calendar. And so even today, you can look at a lot of the holidays and say, you know, ultimately it's about Jesus Christ. Even the 4th of July, we celebrate our freedom and how proud we are to be Americans. But as a Christian, we also think about how proud we are to be Christians because Jesus died on the cross to purchase not just our freedom to be Americans, but our freedom to become the people of God. And Jesus is doing something of the sort with Passover, that it's no longer about the lamb that was slain in the book of Exodus, it's about the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. How do I know that? 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7, Paul says, for Christ our Passover lamb has been sacrificed. So this is an incredible statement that the Lord Jesus Christ is making. Years ago, there was a woman working at a factory who was feeling sad, and her coworker said to her, you know, what's wrong? I can see something is terribly wrong. And she said, you know what? I, I need a kidney transplant. I've been waiting almost a year. I haven't found a donor, and if I don't find a donor soon, I don't know how much longer I'm gonna live. And her coworker had compassion for her. He couldn't imagine just standing by and letting her die when he felt like in his heart he could help. And he said, I'll tell you what, if I'm a match, I would be honored to donate a kidney. And she said, really? And he said, yeah. And it worked out that he was a match. And he was able to donate a kidney and it saved her life. And she was so grateful that he did that. For years afterwards, they would get together for lunch at least once a month and have a gratitude meal where she can express her gratitude for him saving her life and he can express his gratitude for an opportunity to help. In essence, that's what the Lord's Supper is. It's a gratitude meal. It's a chance for us to come to the table of God and say, thank you, Jesus, for giving your body and blood to save my life. And also, it's a chance for us to say, thank you for saving me so I can be a blessing to others and I can be used of you in your service in the world. Well, you say, Pastor Mark, I, I got a question about this. When Jesus takes the bread and says, this is my body which is broken for you, how can the bread be Christ's body when it's his actual body that's holding the bread? 
And how could the cup be the blood of Christ when Christ's blood is still inside his body and it's not literally inside the cup? I don't understand that. There are, there's a two-part answer to that. Number one, I learned this in English class. This is a metaphor. When Jesus says, this is my body, he's saying, this symbolizes my body. This represents my body. When he takes the cup, he's saying, this symbolizes my blood. This represents my blood. The bread and the wine symbolize the new covenant that God is making with us, just as the bread and the wine symbolize the old covenant that God made with Moses and the elders of Israel in Exodus chapter 24, verses 7 and 8. But I can't leave the conversation there. There's one other point that we need to mention. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 16 says, Is not the bread of which we partake a participation in the body of Christ? And is not the cup of which we partake a participation in the blood of Christ? So when we take communion, we are not only communing face to face with the Lord Jesus Christ, in a spiritual sense, we are partaking of his body and his blood. So it's more than just a memorial service. There is a spiritual transaction happening where we are being fed spiritually at the service. We call this the reformed view of Holy Communion. And then Paul goes on to say, that as we take communion, we need to remember what Jesus did for us. And the way we do that is when we partake, we say, Lord, I remember how in the Bible you shed your blood on the cross. You took the nails in your hands, the spike that nailed your feet to the cross. You went through all that pain and that punishment and that penalty and that suffering, and you did it to pay the price for my sins. And this is my way of expressing my gratitude and saying thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of my heart. But not only in communion do we look back at what Jesus did for us. Number two, Paul says we look forward to what Jesus is going to do for us. Look at verse 26. He says when you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. So when we take communion, we're also looking ahead to the day when Jesus comes back to take us to be with him so that we can celebrate communion in person. Except when we do that, it's going to be called the wedding supper of the Lamb. And we read a little bit about it in Matthew chapter 8, verse 11, where... Jesus says that we will be feasting and drinking with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. And Jesus even made that point. He said, I won't eat the bread and drink the wine again until I drink it with you in the kingdom. The third thing we need to do when we take communion is not only do we need to look back and look ahead at what he's going to do, we need to look within. Verse 28 it says that if you eat and drink without you know, looking within or looking at the body of the Lord, you eat and drink judgment on yourself. And so we need to examine our own lives. Is there any sin in my life? Is there any bad attitude? Is there any grudge that I'm holding on to that I need to repent of and give to the Lord before I partake of the table? of the Lord. But I also need to make a qualifying statement. You don't have to be perfect to take communion. Paul's not saying that. But he is saying if you become aware of something, if there's something you need to bring before God, you need to examine yourself and if it's there, apologize to God, repent of it, confess it, and then you can partake of the table. But you don't have to make yourself perfect because otherwise no one's ever going to take communion if you wait for that to happen. I heard about a woman who was in church and they were passing the communion elements around and she denied she wouldn't take it and she started crying. And the pastor said, well, 
what's wrong? And she said, I'm not worthy to take communion. And he said, well, if you're waiting to be worthy to take communion, none of us are ever going to be able to take communion. I'm not going to be able to take communion. So go ahead and take it. It's for God's people. So I want you to partake in communion tonight. And I'll make another qualification. Just because you don't have to be perfect, that's not a license to treat the communion table flippantly either. We still come before God with a sense of awe and a sense of reverence when we come to partake. And then the fourth thing that we need to do before we take communion is we need to look around. Is there anybody in the church tonight that we need to make peace with? Are there, is there any issue that needs to be brought up? Are there any relationships in your life that need to be made right? Because that's very important also before we partake of the table of the Lord. I think that if possible, every Christian should watch the movie Places in the Heart with Sally Field and Danny Glover. And especially if you're going to be a pastor someday, you need to watch the last scene of that movie. It's really, really powerful. The whole movie takes place in the 1930s. It's about racial tension that takes place in a small town in the South. And there are some people that get killed in that movie, and it never should have happened. But at the end of the movie, they're all in church, the people who are still alive and the ones who died earlier in the movie, and they're all sitting shoulder to shoulder in church. That's how you know they made the movie before the pandemic, because they wouldn't be doing that during the pandemic. But they're passing the bread and the wine, and they're tearing off a piece of bread and giving it to the next. That's another thing we wouldn't do anymore in the post-pandemic world. But they're sharing the bread, and it always confused me. For a long time, I'm thinking, well, what in the world's going on? How could people who are dead be taking communion with people who are still alive? What's going on? And I Googled it. I found out that this was the vision of the movie makers. The movie maker was saying, I have a dream that someday, whether you're black or white, a man or a woman or a child, you'll be able to sit at the table of the Lord together as brothers and sisters in Christ. I have a dream that someday we will no longer be divided by politics or culture or social ideas, but that we will be one in the Spirit and one in the Lord. That's what Holy Communion is all about, is putting aside some of the social distinctions that society likes to put on us and coming together saying we are all equal at the foot of the cross. We all need this grace of Jesus. We all need this time before the Lord. So I invite you tonight to partake of Holy Communion with us and to come toward the table of the Lord looking back at what he did for you, looking ahead to what he's going to do for you, looking within to see if there are any bad attitudes, and looking around to see if there's someone with whom you need to make peace. And if you're here tonight and you're not a believer, I invite you to Jesus because he went to the cross and died for you and rose again so you can have eternal life and there will always be a place for you at his table in his house. Jesus loves you. This I know. For the Bible tells me so. Amen. We'll remain seated.
probably pray Man. for her on the prayer chain tonight. We'll go ahead and this look is the to the Lord in prayer. God, I just want to thank you for your blessings. We thank you for your goodness. And we thank you that we can look back, look ahead, look within, and look around as we prepare to go to the table of the Lord. And we just pray, Lord, for all the unspoken requests. Even though um, there's only one that was vocalized, we all have needs before God. Maybe they're hidden deep within our hearts. But God, I pray you administer to each and every one in the name of Jesus and hear their prayer. We also pray for my mom. We pray for both physical and spiritual healing, that she'll be healed of this oxygen situation. She'll know what it is as well. And also that she will be brought into right relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we also pray, Lord, for our leaders. We pray, Lord, for President Biden, Governor Evers, and we Pray for Senator Johnson, Senator Baldwin, all those in positions of authority. Help them to make wise choices. Anoint them and give them blessings when they do what is right. But if there is a situation where they are tempted to do the wrong thing, we pray also, Lord, that you would sovereignly intervene and, and not allow those bad things to happen. That you would protect our troops, protect our nation. And we pray for the United States of America. We pray, Lord, for those who are in law enforcement, those who are in medical service, those who are firefighters and EMTs and teachers and pastors and evangelists. Watch over those who watch over us. Most of all, God, we thank you for Jesus himself who taught us to pray the Lord's Prayer, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And there is going to be information on the screen about giving. And thank you for giving to the Lord. Father, thank you for these gifts and help us to use them wisely for ministry. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. You may be seated. This table is open to all who confess Jesus as the Christ and seek to follow Christ's way. In Luke's gospel, we read that Jesus at the table with two of the disciples took bread and blessed and broke it. When he gave it to them, their eyes were open and they recognized the risen Christ in the breaking of the bread. In the Acts of the Apostles, we read that the church was gathered often in the homes of believers. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Jesus, the bread of life, we gather at your table to know you in the breaking of the bread. God be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give God thanks and praise. suffering and to accept the pain of death, being upon himself the sin of us all. We rejoice that in a perfect victory over the grave,
what your work may be done in the world. With the faithful in every place and time, we praise with joy your holy name. Holy, 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 God of love and majesty, the whole universe speaks of your glory, O God most high. We remember that on the night of betrayal and desertion, Jesus took bread and gave thanks and broke the bread and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body, which will be broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, Jesus also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Consecrate, therefore, Lord, by your Holy Spirit, these gifts of bread and wine, and bless us that receive them at this table, that we may offer you our faith and praise, that we may be united with Christ and with one another, and that we may continue faithful in all things. In the strength Christ gives us, we offer ourselves to you, eternal God, and give thanks that you have called us to serve you. Amen. Come, for all things are now ready. This is the body of Christ, broken for you. Let us partake together. This is the blood of Christ, poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. Let us partake together. Let us pray the prayer of thanksgiving found upon the screen. We thank you, almighty, everlasting God, for inviting us to this table where we have known the presence of Christ and have received all of Christ's gifts. Strengthen our faith, increase our love for one another, and help us to praise you with our lives. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. Thank you.
eternity. Amen. Well, thank you for worshiping the Lord with us on this Holy Thursday. And we have worship tomorrow, 1 o'clock, Good Friday. But let me leave you with these words of encouragement. Peace to the brothers and sisters in love with faith from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace to all who love our Lord Jesus Christ with an undying love. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful rest of the evening and rest of the weekend. And go in peace. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus Oh, precious is the flow That makes me white as snow No other fount I know Nothing but the blood of Jesus Nothing can for sin atone Nothing but the blood of